already know we're gonna get into this mother freaking music right but uh my lips feel a little chaps so i think i put something on but we're gonna get into this music all right before i mother freaking get into it, i want to let y'all know that we're doing something a little different in this stream so we're watching a documentary and it's called oh excuse me found voices and it's um it's a, a narrative that comes from actual people who were once upon a time enslaved in the United States of America and they're discussing their uh, experiences. So we're going to watch this together. I'm going to paint these shoes. I was, you know, I'm customizing, well not customizing them, restoring them. I bought them used, fixed them up, darkened them up, you know, so they're not all ashy looking and all that. But what I'm going to do, because the white looking a little crazy, I'm going to use this smug freaking nail polish remover and I'm going to remove all this white paint and repaint the white parts and then bam, it's done. I'm selling these bad boys. So, yeah. But um, without further ado, let's get into this music, man. So give me a second. Give me a second. Okay.
play this video out. You already seen the title because I'm over here messing around. And uh, she showed it to you thinking that everything was right. It's Found Voices, Slave Narratives, Full Broadcast, Nightline of 1999. All right. We're going to get into this video. Right. The first few seconds, I'm going to be absent because I got to go get some rubbing alcohol because for some reason... If this is a focus, but I got some sticky, some sticky on this white part. And I know alcohol could get it off and I don't want to play around too much with this nail polish remover and it be done take off something that I don't want it to take off. So I'm going to discard this mother freaker. January 12th, 1999. My name is Houghton Hughes. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson, and now I am 101 years old. They are voices that break a silence. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows. Witnesses to a time we only know from photographs and the written word. But they were there. He said all that, stood all that pretty face. All day long, seeing them soldiers going back to silent zone in different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers in jail. Born to slavery. But we didn't have no property. We didn't have no home. And now we can hear them speak. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. Found Voices. The Slave's Life. Told by those who lived it. That mother sucker says the slave life. Oh, eh? <laughs> All right, I'm playing around. I just wanted to unmute my mic. <laughs> From ABC News, this is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Imagine for a moment but what it'll be like for Americans two or three generations hence. Assuming, of course, that we haven't blown ourselves back into the Stone Age and that someone can still figure out what format everything was in. Assuming all of that, our great-great-grandchildren will know more about us than any generation in the history of the world has ever known about its ancestors. There'll be photographs, of course, black and white and color, audio cassettes, and in a few families, eight and 16 millimeter film, and there will be thousands upon thousands of miles of videotape on which we will have recorded everything that struck us as interesting or funny or important about the milestones of our lives and those of our friends and families they will be able to see and hear us long after we are dead. Imagine if we could only do the same. If we could only bring back the voices and images, and most important of all, the memories of those who lived a hundred or more years ago. Well, brace yourselves for a minor miracle. For reasons I'll explain as we go along, we have the voices and the memories and a few black and white photographs to go along of some men and women who were born, some of them, 150 years ago. And what makes these recollections all the more remarkable is that these men and women had been bought and sold like so much livestock. Tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can't. Been slaves all our lives. Your mother was a slave, your sister was a slave, your father was a slave. They know nothing about reading right All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your missus. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after she didn't go, just, turned, just like he turned some out, you know, they didn't know where to go. They are haunting voices from the past, not actors reading a script or scholars reading a text but the actual voices of men and women, Americans, who were born in slavery. My name is Houghton Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. 
My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Incredible as it seems, we are listening to the voices of ex-slaves telling of their lives in bondage. Men like Fountain Hughes on the living conditions of slaves in Virginia in the 1860s when he was a teenager. A lot of people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. You want to slip on the floor. Hot here and hot there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't... We didn't know nothing. Didn't like looking no book. Women like Laura Smalley, describing the makeshift church where slaves worshipped on a big plantation in East Texas. All the church would have be a tub, tub of water sitting just like this thing is, you know, and that would catch your voice, and they would they would have church around that tub, all of them get around the tub. Or Harriet Smith, remembering what she saw as a small girl during the final days of the Civil War. We said, oh, I stood on that picket fence all day long seeing them soldiers going back to San Antonio and different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers in Joe. That's right mm-hmm. along by our house. Our home is a two-story house. A white These place. recorded memories we were among thousands of interviews oh, done see. with we ex-slaves in the 1930s and 40s. The majority were written interviews published in pamphlets and books. A handful were recorded on the latest equipment of the day, 200-pound portable recorders that a hearty band of folklorists lugged across the South. These recordings, once scratchy, distant, filled with the crackle and pop of that primitive equipment, Nothing worries me. I'm not, my head ain't even white. Now have been cleaned up through the magic of modern technology, digitized. I'm the oldest one that I know that's living. The age of the computer has reached back to polish a memory from another century, 150 years ago. Can you remember slavery days very well? Of course, I remember all our white folks and all the names of them, all the children. Call everyone the children's name. Who, who did you belong? Jim Button, the baby boy. The results of these digitally enhanced recordings are arresting, almost unbelievable. The idea of hearing the voices of actual slaves from the plantations of the Old South is as powerful, as startling, really, as if you could hear Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee speak. Listen again to Fountain Hughes, who was born in 1848. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that. Have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and beat on you the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Much of what these three former slaves say may at first seem unremarkable. Much of what they say may surprise and upset, and their calm demeanor is at odds with the evil and violence we associate with slavery. Here is 91-year-old Texan Laura Smalley talking in the 1940s about the outcome of a tussle between two women, one black, one white, one slave, one mistress. The mistress tried to slap the slave, but the black woman pushed her into a chair. Laura Smalley was a girl at the time, but she remembers vividly what happened to the black woman when the master came home. Well, they take that old woman, poor old woman, cat in the peach orchard, and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well, looked like to me, I can't. And round the tree and whipped her. And, well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it, it just had a clothes off down to a waist, you know. They didn't have a plum naked, but they had a clothes down to a waist. And every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. She snuffed the pipe out on her. There'd be no embers in the pipe. I'm where you'll see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on her? Mm-hmm. Good call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by First Union.
This is a world only a few know well. A world of risk and uncertainty. Where the roads can take you to success or prosperity. Or sometimes to no place at all. This is the financial world. For decades, banks and investment firms of mountainous size have ruled the land. Yet high above the horizon, another mountain has risen. A mountain called First Union. With 16 million customers, the nation's eighth largest brokerage and sixth largest bank. For a new perspective of the financial world, come to the mountain called First Union. ...of hell, some drug confined, a journey you will never forget on 2020 Wednesday. What is remarkable in the taped recollections of these ex-slaves is the lack of anger. Remember, though, that these are the recollections of people who were children or teenagers during slavery. Remember, too, how intimidating it is for most of us today to have a microphone or camera thrust at us and to be asked questions on the street. It must have been even more daunting for poor blacks living in a highly segregated South to be asked by white strangers using a strange machine to talk candidly about being slaves. For all that, it is startling how much the ex-slaves reveal. Fear, hunger, unrelenting work, but also fondness for masters, perhaps even love. Harriet Smith's family, for example, were the only slaves of an East Texas farmer and his family. They lived in a cabin next to their masters in circumstances not markedly different, even attended the same church, only at different times. So I went to Mountain City to the white folks' church many times. See, the white folks would have church in the morning, then they'd let the colored people have church at their church in the evening. And your slavery. In slave time. Laura Smalley lived in the same area of Texas as Harriet Smith, near the Brazos River, one of more than 100 slaves on a big cotton plantation. Religion offered no consolation to the slaves here because the master forbade them the practice of religion, and there was hell to pay if the master caught them at prayer. They don't have no church. No, they never have no church. And uh, old master come along with one of them. One of them was, uh, was there having church around the tub, and he's down praying. The old master come in, he just a praying. He come in, he did, and told him to get up from there. He didn't get up, he just a praying. He said, the old master come in, so whoop me. He quit praying and then asked the Lord, how much on the old master? The old master, my shoulder, hooked with a bull hook. He said, how much on the old master? And said, old master, whooped him in the camp, wouldn't get up, you know, just flinch, you know, just like a person, you know, a person hits you, you know, it flinch. He just prayed for old master. The old master stepped back and said, I'm ready mind to kick you naked. I'm ready mind to kick you naked. The nigga never to stop praying, you know, he had, he had to go on leaving praying. Mm. He had to go on leaving praying. <laughs> Because he wouldn't stop. The plantation on which Smalley was a slave sounds brutal. She recalls scrambling with other children for food from a huge wooden tray, like a hog trough. All of them, you know, would get around that tray with spoons and eat, it would sit you like moisture, soup or something like that. And all the other children would get around there and just eat, 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 eat. Fountain Hughes tells his interviewer about the relentless round of work for him on a Virginia plantation. The night and hour come out. You had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they want you to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. And if they want you to hang all night long, you hang. You hang tobacco. It didn't matter about your tired being tired. You're afraid to say you're tired. It was cotton, not tobacco, that solidified slavery, though. The invention of the cotton gin at the end of the 18th century made its processing easy, but the crop still needed enormous amounts of unskilled labor. 
control of the slave and his labor through laws and regulations became paramount. Fountain Hughes talks about one of those controls, the pass system. Now, I couldn't go from here across the street, or I couldn't go from nobody's house that I have a note or something from my master. And if I had that pass, I don't really call it a pass. If I had that pass, I could go wherever he sent me, and I'd have to be back. You know, when I, whoever he sent me to, they, they'd give me another pass, and I'd bring that back, so it's a show how long I even emancipation didn't truly free the slaves. Freedom freed slaves for more travail. The end of the Civil War found many cast adrift without skills and no place to go. And the Yankees who freed them weren't always seen as benevolent liberators. I remember when the Yankees came along and took all the good horses and took all the, sort of all the meat and flour and sugar and stuff out in the river and let it go down the river. And they know the people wouldn't have nothing to live on, but they done that. The ex-slaves left one hell for another, perhaps an even more dangerous one. No longer property, they didn't have the protections afforded property. When we were slaves, we couldn't do that, see? Mm -hmm. And if we got free, we didn't know nothing to do. And my mother, she then she hunted places and bound us out for a dollar a month. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing. We didn't have nothing on no, no, just to like your cattle, we just turned out and uh, get along the best you could. In Texas, the slaves weren't told they were free until two months after the war ended. Smalley remembers that her masters gave the slaves a dinner, and then they were free. I don't hide the other side of the folks, you know, freedom. We didn't know. They just thought, you know, we're just feeding us, you know. Them, them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned, just like he turned something out, you know. They didn't know where to go. But this where they stayed. Mm -hmm. they didn't know where to go. In the narratives, the slaves used an interesting phrase for the end of slavery. They say, when the break came. Good times, easy times, were not at hand. The trials for millions of black Americans didn't end in 1865. They continued. Laura Smalley and her family became sharecroppers. Harriet Smith's first husband was killed by whites during the Reconstruction, probably because of his political organizing. Fountain Hughes went north to Baltimore and worked at numerous jobs, including hauling manure. Not an enviable job, but it was the job of a free man. It's funny that they said that they didn't even feel free even after, you know, slavery's abolition. And yet, they took up jobs like this man said. He mother freaking pushed doo doo. You know, mother freaking this lady says she took up sharecropping. And it's crazy because this is a job that this lady says she picked up when slavery ended, which was 18, post 1860s, you know what I'm saying? Going in, <laughs> it was post slavery. Yet here it is. My dad was born 1962, almost a hundred years after slavery ends. And my dad was saying that he still has memories as young as four and five years old, working on fields, toting around these heavy bags of stuff that he didn't even know what it was at the time until he began to get older. And then that's when he was telling us about how he was a sharecropper and he was tending to tobacco and stuff like that. And I think it's crazy because my dad was born in 18 or 1962. Here it is today, my dad is 60 years old and he has memories in his adolescence, you know, as young as a mother freaking toddler to his adolescence that 
he was a sharecropper. My dad is so traumatized that not only the experiences that he had with his own dad, you know, because my granddad was born, I want to say it was 1929 on my dad's side and my grandmother was around that time. But it's crazy because <laughs> here it is, my grandparents. Are older than my daddy but aren't old enough to have been born in slavery yet their jobs are very very similar to those who were enslaved and had gainful employment right here it is this man sitting here talking about how they needed a pass to go to and fro from his master and then this lady saying they had nowhere to go when they was released and supposedly freed. They don't know where they can folk at because for, for hundreds of years, black people has just been passed around and sold like cattle. And now all of a sudden they told to be free. And that's when all these black codes come in and you needed to have a job. That's why sharecropping exists. Sharecropping is the new found slavery. Because now as a sharecropper, you're basically doing the same job that you were doing when you were mother freaking enslaved. The only difference is, is that you are living on the premise, the land of the property of an enslaver, right? And they're charging you to live on their property and use their property to do your sharecropping duties, which comes out of what you work. So they'll hire you to mother freaking live in this tiny shed and to do tobacco. But in order to live in that, that shed, you got to pay them. You need some kind of money. It's acquired through the work, but now you got to put in all these hours to compensate your job and your mother freaking housing. And God forbid you need some tools. Now they're like, well, I'm gonna have to charge you for that too, because you don't got your own tools. You just recently been, been freed from slavery. <laughs> they expect you to have tools. You didn't even know where to go. That's why a lot of people, they didn't even go anywhere. They stayed on the property of their enslavers and continued working working, being enslaved, the same stuff. It, there was literally laws that stated that, vagabond laws that stated if you were seen traveling and not be on somebody's job, it's similar to how children are charged with truancy now. Oh, you ain't at school, little kid? When the government deems you to be at school, well, we're going to put you in the criminal justice system. They the same, oh, you not at work? Okay, you ain't got, a, you ain't got no job? Okay, we're going to arrest you and put you in the criminal justice system because it, le it was literally legal, like illegal to not have a job post-slavery. Black codes. Look into it, man. It's crazy how this world is, but we'll continue looking. We'll, we'll continue watching. Let go. John Henry Falk was among those who interviewed ex-slaves. Falk kept detailed notebooks of his travels and interviews with former slaves and even tried once to pass for black. He told an interviewer just before his death in 1979, I really, I really had getting come educated on blacks and their problems, except we call them colored folks. If some of you think you recognize the name John Henry Falk, you're right. He was a famous radio personality in the 1950s. He was also denounced and eventually blacklisted for, among other things, championing the rights of blacks to vote. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We can thank the Depression for the existence of the slave narratives. That is when John Henry Falk, folklorist John Lomax, his son Alan, and writers like Zora Neale Hurston, the celebrated Harlem Renaissance writer, were touring the South to gather accounts of African-American folk traditions. The subject of slavery was not on their minds. Nobody was going around saying, 
oh, now we've got another former slave recording. But then little by little, they, they started becoming a category. Known to scholars and linguists, the audio tapes of the ex-slaves have been in the archives of the Library of Congress and various libraries around the country since the late 1940s. Kathy Farnell, who works with the Institute of Language and Culture in Clanton, Alabama, is one of the people responsible for the clarity of the ex-slave narrative tapes. Now part of a recently released audio and book package called Remembering Slavery, produced by the Smithsonian Institution and Public Radio International. What I found out was that the technology did not exist to bring these recordings up to broadcast quality by taking out the background static. That technology got invented in the early 1990s. Hearing the tapes had a profound effect on everyone who worked with them. I was truly amazed when I first heard the recorded interviews. I just fell in love with Fountain. He had the type of emotions that, that I really liked. He had anger, and so it, it felt good to me. It validated for me my feeling that this was a horrible, horrible thing to happen to any people. But John Henry Falk may have experienced the most profound effect. He was a graduate student when he interviewed the former slaves, including the two women you hear in this broadcast. Himself interviewed just before he died in 1979, Falk was going on about how he believed in giving blacks the right to go to school, giving them the right to vote, giving them the right to go into anything they qualified for. And then he said he experienced an epiphany. I was sitting out on a wagon tongue with this old black man and was telling him what a different kind of white man I was. I remember him looking at me very sadly and kind of sweetly and condescending and said, you know, you still got the disease, honey. I know you think you're cured, but you're not cured. You can't give me the right to be a human being. I'm born with that right. Now, you can keep me from having that if you've got all the policemen and all the jobs on your side. You can deprive me of it, but you can't give it to me because I was born with it just like you was. My God, it had a profound effect on me. I was furious with him. But the more I reflected on it, the more profoundly it affected me. And I realized this was where it really was. But the final word belongs to Fountain Hughes. When asked by his interviewer which he would rather be, free or slave, he answered with intensity. Me? Which I'd rather be? <laughs> you know what I'd rather do? If I thought, had any idea, that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a run and just end it all right away. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. I'll be back with a closing thought in a moment. Justices, the voices we've heard tonight have an importance far beyond their number. Professor Orlando Patterson of Harvard has written that it is not surprising that freedom and the love of it have often been born in slaveholding societies. In ancient Greece, to cite one example, among the slaveholding founders of our own country, to cite another. The existence of slavery in such societies, says Professor Patterson, elevates freedom, makes it more precious, more valuable not only to those who are not free, but to those who are. This broadcast, I'd like to add, was lovingly compiled and largely created by our own senior producer, Karen DeWitt. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us... But I was saying that I'm already searching out this motherfucking book on my phone. Let me get it back here. Sorry. But I'm searching this book out on my phone so I could hear the voices. They talking about it comes like a package or whatever. So I'm going uh, I'm to see if I could find not only the book, but I want to hear the audio as well. But um, I hope you learned something from it. It wasn't really as in-depth as I, I thought it was going to be. I wish that, well, not wish, but I had hope that they were more thorough, but what can you expect? This is from like the 90s. I mean, we saw the Michael Jordan commercials, so it is what it is. But uh, I hope you learned something and it inspire you to go seek information because a lot of people 
when it comes to slavery, they thought process is misconstrued, man, because a lot of black people now are trying to say that white man pushed Christianity on us and all this other sort. And we hear from people who were born in slavery, say it themselves that here it is. This man got beat for praying because he was in the middle of church. He was praying and he kept on praying and he kept on praying despite the turmoil and beating that he was endured, you know, but yet we think that Jesus was pushed onto us by, by racist white people. How racist white people was limiting, you know, the, our access to church. It was, they literally, I mean, it was said that it was made illegal to even attend church as a slave. You see what I'm saying? So we got to educate ourselves because the further we get from history with more and more old people dying, we are losing our history, right? And even the Bible says for God's people perish for lack of knowledge. We ain't trying to be there, man. So educate yourself, stay prayed up and trust and believe that wisdom and knowledge comes from Jesus Christ. Ask him for it and he'll grant it to you. As long as you believe in your heart, we got a shadow of a doubt that he will provide it for you. I love y'all. God bless. Stay prayed up. Watch as well as pray. Peace. Oh, oh, oh.